In this lesson, we are going to be looking at the HESAP uh, seven principles. As we know, HESAP has 12 stages and the last seven are called the seven principles of HESAP. They are the following, conducting a hazard analysis, determining the critical control points, setting critical limits, establishing monitoring procedures, establishing corrective actions, Principle six is verify, then validate. Then principle seven is establish good re record keeping. So now let's look at the first principle, which is principle one, under conducting a hazard analysis. So basically what is expected of you there is to ensure that you list all the process steps where your product uh, goes in your facility, and then you identify what hazards could potentially occur uh, or be introduced or grow or survive in that particular process steps. You must ensure that you look at the four categories of hazards, which are biological, chemical, as well as physical. What is very important there, you must determine whether they're being present or they are present, they're being uh, introduced, they're growing or surviving, as well as the source of um, those particular hazards. It's very important also to determine how is it that you are going to be able to control. So if you can see from this slide, this is an example of how you can do that. So if you look at this um, uh, presentation here, or this example of a hazard analysis, you'll see that on column two, there is a process input that indicates what goes into the process. And then on column three, there's a transfer method that indicates how the product moves from one step to, the, to another. And then the process step, that's where you list the actual processes where your product goes through. It's important for you to identify your main raw ingredient, and this is what you're going to follow and how it is transformed from one um, a condition to another. For an example here, we are looking at a whole pineapple that is received and how then they transform it from becoming, a, you know, a, just a raw pineapple to becoming a dried pineapple. And then on column number five, we are looking at the waste or byproduct that are coming out of each process. And then column six, we are actually now doing the actual hazard analysis. So basically, uh, principle one, this is where it actually starts. You'll notice that in the previous lesson, we looked at the preliminary stages of HESAP, and one of them was, uh, which was stage four and five, we're looking at the process flow. So before the hazard analysis, you must ensure that you do this preparatory work. Column seven, we are looking at the sources of hazards. In column uh, eight, you are looking at the controls in, uh, of those particular hazards that we've identified. And also then column number nine, we are looking at the records where we keep track of exactly how we execute each one of these control measures. So this is basically a summary on how one can do a hazard analysis. Obviously, it becomes more comprehensive than this summary, but for the purposes of this course, this should be sufficient. You'll see at the top, we have indicated the legend, uh, indicating what this B means, uh, what this C means, what this A, what this P means. You'll see that B stands for biological, C stands for chemical, A stands for allergens, and P stands for physical. And then the mustard color represent that that particular process is customer specific, meaning that only that particular process goes through. Uh, there is a certain uh, process where a customer would require that maybe there's an additional additive or preservative that is added. And then the red that pertains to a CCP. So that will be indicated here on each one of these fields to indicate whether it is a CCP or customer specific. And on the last two columns, basically we are just indicating uh, how each process must be executed. So now let's move to principle number two, where we are looking at uh, identifying critical control points. It is important firstly to understand what a critical control point is. A critical control point is a process step that aims to either eliminate or uh, prevent or reduce a significant hazard to an acceptable level. And if you can look at these steps, uh, one that stands to be a CCP is a cooking step because we know from our previous lessons that 
cooking does in fact have a negative uh, influence on pathogens, so it can kill pathogens. So if you were worried about pathogens being present on your product, uh, in your product, then cooking would be a step that you would identify as a CCP. Uh, and normally we use a decision tree to identify what a CCP is, but it's not compulsory for you to use a decision tree. It's basically a tool that one can use to determine a critical control point. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that there's Q1, there's Q2, there's Q3, there's Q4, and there's Q5. It basically directs you what is it that you'll determine as a CCP based on the questions that uh, uh, you have to ask and the answer that you provide. So that is stage seven and principle number two. Now let's move to principle, principle three, which is stage eight. So here we have to establish critical limits. So what is a critical limit? Basically a critical limit is the value or the process parameter that differentiates uh, a safe and unsafe uh, measure or parameter that will ensure that your product is produced according to the requirements of your processes. So let's make it practical. What do you mean by that? So we said that the previous um, principle, cooking is a CCP. So a critical limit will be the temperature that you must reach in order to remove a significant hazard or bring it under control. So basically it differentiates or it indicates what must be achieved to ensure the safety of food processing steps. And that value or parameter that you've identified, you can then uh, make sure that all measures are done to ensure that your process reaches that particular value or complies with that parameter. If it doesn't or it's over or under, then you'll say that your critical limits have not been reached and therefore your product may be unsafe to sell to the consumers. Your critical limits must be observable, uh, you must be measurable and sub subject to real-time monitoring. So in other words, you must be able to control uh, your um, uh, critical limits just in case you lose control of your process. And you can see here, we have made an example of a metal detector with the test pieces. So it will indicate the value. You can see the for non-ferrous metals is 1.5 uh, uh, millimeters. So that will be your critical limit, meaning that any metal that is above that will uh, be unsafe for the consumer to, to, to consume that particular product. Let's now move to principle four uh, that pertains to monitoring procedures for CCPs. Uh, and that is stage nine. So basically here we are looking at how do we monitor the CCP. We are looking at who monitors the CCP, when do they monitor the frequency, how do they monitor the equipment they are using, and what exactly is it that they're supposed to monitor. And it is important that the CCP operator who has this responsibility is adequately trained and that uh, he or she is familiar with the process that um, he or she is supposed to observe. Now let's move to principle five, establishing corrective actions. Uh, we firstly need to differentiate what, it, what a corrective action is uh, and differentiate it from a correction. A correction is taking action to correct a problem. So it's an immediate fix that you implement at that particular point to ensure that the process does not continue because it will make the product unsafe for the consumer. And normally what you'll do if it is a machine, you'll switch it off and then you quarantine the product uh, to then determine what could have gone wrong. So a, a correction, you do it now to bring the process at, under control at that particular point. And then a corrective action is when you have to ensure that you investigate, you conduct a root analysis to establish what a problem is uh, uh, to ensure that it doesn't reoccur. There are many other uh, tools that are used, but the most popular is a fishbone diagram as well as the five Ys. And why is it called a, a root cause analysis? Because you have got to get to the fundamental cause of the problem in order to prevent reoccurrence. 
An example of this, uh, perhaps you were cooking food and it did not reach the required temperature. Maybe you were supposed to cook for uh, two hours, but it, you cooked for less. So what you'll do in order to ensure that you do not sell that particular product that has been deemed unsafe, you will either recook the product or maybe you dispose of depending on what your, um, your, your company processes are. But normally if it is a product that can be recouped without affecting the quality then of course you'll do that uh, but then you'll do an investigation to determine why the process failed in the first place why did it not reach the required temperature now let's move to principle number six which is stage 11 here we are going to be looking at verification and validation so basically we need to firstly understand what verification is and, and what validation is. When we say that we are verifying something, we are looking at whether is it still working according to the accepted standard operating procedure. Validation, can it work uh, in our product, in our facility? So that's what validation means. Let's make an example. Uh, verification, we looked at the metal detector earlier on. So if you have got a metal detector that you procure and buy and bring to your facility, you will need to validate if it can work on your product and also uh, on metals that are found in your facility. So you'll do a validation study uh, at the beginning before you commission it. Uh, to take your product and then take whatever metals that are found in your facility and put it inside your product. Then you have to just show that the metal detector can indeed uh, uh, identify those metals in your product. Then verifying, you'll use test pieces on daily basis to check if it can still identify the metal. So the manufacturer will give you test pieces uh, and those test pieces will use uh, to check if indeed uh, they can still be um, picked up by your metal detector. So that is verification. It is important that whatever that you do in terms of verification is recorded to prove that indeed your HESAP system is functioning. So you'll ensure that your verification records are kept by your member of staff as well as your validation study. The last principle, which is um, uh, Principle um, number seven, it pertains to documentation or record keeping. Whatever that you do needs to be recorded uh, at all times. Uh, and that is very important when it comes to traceability as well as your audits. And also it determines or demonstrates compliance to the HESA plan. So whomever wants to look at your records, you present them with your verification and validation records to prove that indeed you have done what you're supposed to do uh, pertaining to your, your HESAP system. And also supports a due diligence defense if this is required in court, uh, because you'll have records to prove that you are doing whatever that you must to ensure that the product that you are supplying to the consumers is safe. Then uh, let's look at the examples of records that you ought to keep. Uh, it could be the details of the HESAP team, uh, signed and dated monitoring records, the flow diagram, uh, a flow plan, uh, evidence of compliance with the prerequisite programs, uh, the intended customers, product descriptions, etc. So there are many records that you can keep. It will depend on the audit criteria that you have, whether it's a PRC system, it's a HACCP system, or maybe FSSC. And that will be uh, a determining factor to indicate what is it that you are supposed to have. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our lesson. Uh, I hope that there is something that you have learned. Just to recap, in the first video, we look at uh, the brief overview of HESAP. The second video, we looked at the preliminary stages of HESAP. And then in this last video, we were basically looking at uh, the seven principles of HESAP. As I've said earlier, there is a course dedicated to HESAP. This, is, this just gives you an overview of what HESAP is, as well as its benefit to you as a business. Thank you.